It is so wonderful to be here with you guys every Saturday morning, every Shabbat. Well, what we're going to do, I don't know how many of you think I talk fast, but we're going to have to really go fast. <laughs> Good thing we got notes and CDs. The part of the problem I had was there wasn't enough for two lessons, but there's a little more than one. So I, we've got a bunch of notes and we're going to be flying through and I won't be reading everything on your notes. We'll kind of be skipping around. But how many of you so far kind of see Song of Solomon a little differently than you have before? It's a whole new perspective on this. And we're going to finish it up and we're in chapter six right now. And verse Two and three, one of the things for those of you who haven't been here for any of this, you, you basically know who's speaking. Whenever he's speaking about her, he says, my love. Whenever she speaks about him, she used the term, uh, my beloved. Last week, we had talked about how she had claimed the garden belonged to her. And now she realizes that it belongs to him. And she says, uh, my beloved has gone down to what? His garden, to the beds of spices. To feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. Now, do you remember what it means to gather lilies? That's basically like, uh, uh, you know, he that gathers the sheaves will surely come rejoicing. You know, the same concept of a harvest is people, it's souls. So what he's talking about is here the Messiah is gathering lilies. He's gathering souls to himself. And then she says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And then she says again, he feeds among the lilies, right? God uses a lot of different things. He calls us sheep. He calls us lilies. I mean, all different typologies. But what you notice here, there's been a big change from the very beginning. If you'll notice in Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse 16 earlier, she said, my beloved is mine and I am his. So in other words, she was saying, God, you belong to me first and then I belong to you. But now she has totally changed it around and she realizes, no, I belong to him and then him to me. And you're going to see another change. This whole phrase changes yet another time as she matures in her spiritual walk. The other thing is in Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse seven, she says, tell me, O thou whom my soul loves, where you feed. So in chapter one, she had no clue where he feeds. Now she knows he's feeding among the lilies. He's beginning to understand his work, his walk, the things that he does. Often like us, when we first come to the Messiah, how many of you hopefully are further along now than you were when you first came? Matured a little bit. Well, here she's maturing. And then the other thing is you see in uh, verse 416 where she says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon what? So here you see before she thought it was her garden. Now she realizes, no, it is his garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. And Psalm 126.6 is what I was basically quoting a little bit ago. It says, he that goes forth and weeps, bringing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The wheat represents good people, tares, bad people. So God is always using different analogies so we get it. It's amazing that he can do that. And at the same time, we still don't get it. <clears throat> but here, here was is amazing. If you recall last week, she just gave this wonderful testimony about how wonderful he was. Remember that last week? Talking about how, let me, for those of you that weren't here, gosh. Uh, if you go to Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 5, if you have your Bibles there, you'll notice she went. The first time she had fallen asleep, she gets up and the watchmen find her. And she asks, have you seen the whom my soul loves? And then all of a sudden he appears. This time she goes to sleep again. And it's a worse situation because he was rebellious. Okay. And now the watchman, you know, beat the cheese out of her, basically. Rip her veil off. And uh, so now she's on the search again. And the daughters of Jerusalem come and says, why should we seek him with you? What's so great about your beloved that makes him different than any other beloved? And so at this point in Song of Solomon 5, uh, starting like in verse 10, she says, My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is the most fine gold, his locks are bushy, as black as raven. You know, she's just saying how wonderful he is. Now, can you imagine the Lord standing right behind her? All right. You know, (laughs) she loves me. (laughs) And um, so all of a sudden, after she testifies how wonderful he is, what does he do? 
again, he appears on the scene. Before, she was searching for him and couldn't find him. But we know it's not until you search for him with what? All your heart. And now he sees her heart's being poured out to the lost, so to speak, the daughters of Jerusalem, seeing how fantastic he is. And then it's like, yeah, you know, he's back. And now here's his comment to her in Song of Solomon 6, 4 through 9. He says, oh, my love, you are as beautiful as what? Did any of you know anything about Terza? Anybody know anything about Terza? We're going to look at Terza here in just a second. As lovely as Jerusalem, as inspiring as armies with banners. And then uh, here the Messiah says, oh, this is just too much. Turn away your eyes from me. You're just too beautiful. Okay, your eyes have overcome me. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats. You know, so he's going on. Remember that picture I showed you several weeks ago? (laughs) But here's what I want you to point out. If you remember last week, I had told you how Solomon, his love was who? The daughters of Jerusalem. Remember? A couple thousand of them. All right? It wasn't for her, and she represents Jerusalem. Right? And look what he says here about her. He says, there are 60 queens, 80 concubines, virgins without number, but my dove, my undefiled is what? So the Messiah, his eyes are not on all the daughters of Jerusalem like Solomon's. His eyes are on her alone. Just like he wants her eyes on him alone. So do you see the difference how in the Song of Solomon, the king is not the same as the shepherd. The king loves all the daughters of Jerusalem, but the Messiah loves just the bride. And uh, in Numbers 26, 33, if you remember, there's daughters of Manasseh uh, from that tribe. They were literally the daughters of uh, Zelophehad. Uh, were, names were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and who? Terza. Terza literally means delightful. And I don't know if you knew this. I've got a picture coming on here. See, there, about here is where Terza also was a city. So not only was Terza one of the names of one of the daughters... It was also a location. And I don't know if you knew this, but the kings of Israel literally reigned there for 32 years. Remember when Israel and Judah separated? It was in Terza that uh, different kings reigned. I have on your notes the verse. You can go look at different verses and see. But it was a total of 32 years that they reigned. And I think it's interesting that he refers to her as, an, as armies with what? With banners. Okay. Now the daughters of Jerusalem chime in in Song of Solomon uh, 21, and they say, Who is she who looks forth like the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome, what? Armies with banners. Now, when you think about armies with banners, I mean, here's just a flag and all these troops. Now, I want you to, I'm going to set the scene here of what is about to happen, and this is also as prophetic of the last days. The word banners in the Hebrew, it's Strong's number 1713, and it means to flaunt. To raise a flag, to be conspicuous. Okay. Now, some of us like to come in the stealth mode. Okay. But God is saying his army is going to be like waving flags on the mountain saying, hey, enemy, look, we're not ducking. We're right here. We're coming up as a think of this massive army of banners on a hill. You know, you think of the old movies, whatever you want to think of. You can see one army all across the hilltop with all their banners. And the other group has all their banners and they come, you know, together. Well, the whole idea is here the bride is not someone who is ducking and hiding. So often we think of it's time to duck and hide, especially when it comes about the tribulation or whatever it is. But we're going to be an army with banners. We're going to be flaunting. Look at Isaiah 13, 1 through 8. And I'm going to put this next picture up because I think it's even more cool. It's like the line of the tribe of Judah. Someone's going to be up as Messiah's coming, telling the whole enemy, here we are. Isaiah 13, it says, remember in Revelation, it's the Babylonian harlot, Babylon's destroyed. Look what it prophesies concerning the last days. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Lift you up a banner, a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice to them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I've commanded my sanctified ones. Now that's supposed to be us, right? I've also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations are gathered together. The Lord of hosts or armies mutters the uh, mustereth, 
mustereth the host of the battle. So God's going to be calling everyone to the battle. There's a good picture. Everyone coming to the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint. Every man's heart will melt. They shall be afraid and pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They'll be in pain as a woman that travails. So men, you get your turn. (laughs) They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces will be as flames. Okay, so think think of this mighty battle that it's talking about. And now the, the daughters of Jerusalem say, wow, you're like this amazing army. And the Shulamite responds back to them. And she says this. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the greenery of the valley, to see whether the vine flowered and the pomegranates budded. I did not know, but my soul set me on the chariots of my princely people. What's amazing, if you remember, before she kept sleeping, she didn't want to go work the harvest. Now, finally, she's matured and she says, I need to get down into the valley. I need to be gathering lilies. I need to be working the harvest. I need to see if the vine is flourishing. And so she she leaves. And now the daughters of Jerusalem are saying, return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. Okay, they want her to come back. She's leaving the presence of Solomon, so to speak, and she's going toward her beloved. But look how she responds this time. She says, well, what are you going to see in the Shulamite? What do you see in me? What's, I mean, so now her eyes are no longer on herself. They're on the Messiah. And the daughters of Jerusalem respond back. Well, we see as it were the company of what? Two armies. Isn't that fascinating? Especially in the light of First Chronicles 14, where it says, David inquired again of God, and God said to him, go not up after them, turn away from them, and come up upon them over against the mulberry trees. And it'll be when you shall hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees that then you shall go out to battle for God has gone forth before you to smite the host of the Philistines. It's like it's not only their army, but the angelic army that's coming right along beside them. And so now the shepherd addresses the Shulamite. And she's, he says this, how beautiful are what? Your feet. And remember in Isaiah 52, it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them who bring the gospel. So, I mean, this is a direct tie-in because now she's been spreading the gospel, the good news. She's working the harvest. Drop down to the next underlying thing. It says, uh, now I don't know how many of you ladies would like this, but he says to her, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. Okay. Here's a nice picture of a nose right there, you know. Now, how, does that sound like a compliment? Your nose is like a Tower of Lebanon. What does that mean? Well, it's that looks toward what direction? Damascus. That's Syria. That's the enemy. When he's saying your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, if you'll drop down to the bottom of page 34, look at Hebrews 5.14. It says, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, what is one of our senses is what? You ever heard the term, I smell a rat? When he says her nose is like a Tower of Lebanon, it says she has good discernment now. Look at the top of 35 in Job 27.3. Remember the Spirit of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, it says? Job 27.3, Job says, all the while my breath is in me, and what? The Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So when he talks to the bride saying your nose is like a tower, he's saying you have great discernment. Okay, you're a watchman on the walls. You're looking toward Damascus. You see the enemy coming. That's what it's referring to. So now you don't feel so bad about having a big nose, right? (laughs) Then the other thing, back to 34, and then we'll jump back over again. He closes with saying your stature is like a palm tree. Okay, well, if you go to 35 in uh, Psalm 95, 12, it says the the righteous shall flourish like what? Like the palm tree. Okay, your stature is like a palm tree. You're upright. You're righteous. And then uh, how does she respond? She responds uh, saying this. She says, I will go up into the palm tree and take hold of its stock. Well, what do we know about the Feast of Tabernacles? In Leviticus 23, 40, God commands saying, you will take on the first day of the boughs of goodly trees, branches of what? Palm tree. So now she's being obedient. She's finally, she's keeping the feast. She's doing the things she's supposed to be doing. And then the shepherd continues here. 
And he says, the smell of your nose is like what? Apples. If we remember back in one of the other chapters, she likened him to the apple tree. Okay, so think of the apple in terms of Torah. Eat of his fruit. It's taste. It tastes good. Uh, Song of Solomon 2, 3, she says of him, as the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under a shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So now what he's communicating is she's finally partaking of the apple tree. She's finally partaking. And then she responds back to him when he says that of her. She says, and the roof of your mouth is like the best wine for my beloved that goes down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are what? To speak. And the word asleep here is the same Hebrew word as those that sleep in the dust of the earth that we were talking about last week. And Messiah was able to bring that life. And then the Shulamite continues. Now look at the big change here. Before it was, I am my beloved, or my beloved is mine and I am his. And then that was reversed. I am my beloved and he is mine. But now she makes no claim at all. In Song of Solomon 7, 10 through 13, she says, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. And then she says this, come, my beloved, and let who? He's been trying to beg her to get down in the field. And finally, she wises up and she's taking the initiative. All right, let's go. It almost reminds me of uh, uh, my wife in, in the YMCA. She loves to exercise. She always wants me to go and exercise with her. One of these days, I'll get up and say, let us go. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> but we're going to try. Yeah, Thanksgiving mornings, he almost killed me at the Y before we ever had turkey. <laughs> but anyway, look at what she says. She says, let us go into the field. Let us stay in the villages. Let us rise up what? Before she kept falling asleep and he had to wake her up. She slept all winter. And now she's saying, hey, guess what? I'm motivated. And then... She says, let us see if the vine, uh, if the vine flowers, whether the tender grape appears. See, earlier in chapter two, he was saying, hey, look, the tender vine, the tender grape is appearing. And she tells him to take a hike. <clears throat> what is that? A what? Pomegranate. What's, what's fascinating, uh, there, pomegranates, how many seeds are in it? Well, there's yeah, all of them. Correct. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes there's, you know, if you, there's sometimes there's less, sometimes there are more, but the average is 613, which is the number of the commandments, which is just kind of fascinating. But anyway, and then it goes on to say, let the pomegranates bud forth. There I will give you my love. So in other words, it's now going to be out in the field, out in the harvest where the work is. The love apples give a scent and over our doors are all pleasant fruits, new and old. What does it mean by new and old? which I've laid up for you. Okay, well, Leviticus 25, let's go back and look at that concept. It talks about the land will yield her fruit, and you're going to eat your fill. You're going to dwell in safety. And then it says, if you'll say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Remember the Shemitah year where they weren't to plant? And I don't know if you know, but just last month started a Shemitah year. This literally is a Sabbath rest. A lot of people in Israel aren't planting. But obviously, if you're a farmer, I mean, they didn't have Safeways back then, okay? And, and so if, what are you going to eat? They didn't have refrigeration necessarily back then either. And so they're saying, well, what are we going to eat the seventh year, Lord? Uh, behold, we're not going to sow. We're not going to gather in our increase. But God says this, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for how many years? Three years. And you will sow the eighth year, and you'll eat of what? The old fruit until the ninth year, until the fruits come in, you shall eat of the what? So she's going to be bringing in fruit, both the new and the old. In other words, she's going to be keeping the Shemitah year, which she never had. She's going to be keeping the Sabbath years. She's actually going to be finally obeying him. And then in chapter 8, the last chapter, verse 2 and 3, I think it's interesting. She says, I would lead you. Okay, who leads who? Does he lead us or do we lead him? (laughs) But here's the thing. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to bring you to my mother's house. I want you to meet my mama. But then she says, you would instruct me. I would cause you to drink spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. But now look at this. His left hand is where? Under my head. His right hand embraces me. That tells you what? She's falling asleep again. You can see this over and over in the book. And so now the shepherd speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem. And he says again, I charge you, her daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or awaken my love until she pleases. And then all of a sudden, before last week, it was Solomon 
the question was, who is this coming up in the wilderness? Solomon, behold, his bed with all these people around it because of fear in the night. Well, now someone else is coming up out of the wilderness. This time it's the Messiah with his bride and the daughters of Jerusalem say, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? Well, in Ezekiel 34, what do we see? God says, I will make with them a covenant of peace, will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall what? Dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. How many of you like to sleep in the woods? Most people are scared to death to sleep in the woods. But God is saying, I'm going to be there. Drop down to the bottom line. It says here, thus shall they know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them. And that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And you, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. So the, again, the Song of Solomon likened then the shepherd to the flock, and he's taking care of his sheep. And then the shepherd addresses the Shulamite, or the Messiah, the bride. And he says, I awakened you from under what? Under the apple tree. And there your mother travailed with you, and there she travailed and bore you. Well, we see in Ezekiel, if you remember, a few weeks ago... About the birth of Jerusalem, he says, as for your birth and the day you were born, your navel wasn't cut. You weren't washed with water to cleanse you. You were not salted nor swaddled. No, I pitied you to do any of these, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out in the open field because your life was despised in the day you were born. It refers to Jerusalem. But he's coming and he's loving her and her alone. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, if you remember, that's the Shema that we started with. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God. It goes on to say this, and this is the problem that we've been seeing. When we get, when our wealth increases, what do we do? We forget the Lord. I mean, that's just constant. Look what this says. It'll be when the Lord your God has brought you to the land, which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and good cities, which you did not build, and houses full of every good thing, which you did not fill, and wells which are dug, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and you will eat and be full. You shall be on guard, lest what? Unless you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slaves. You shall fear the Lord your God, serve him, and swear by his name. Don't go after other gods of the gods of the people all around you. For the Lord your God is what? He's a jealous God. There's a good jealousy and a bad jealousy, and he's a good jealous He says, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and destroy you from off the face of the earth. Now, here we have uh, the Shulamite responding. And she says to him, we, I think it's interesting, it's not I, but it's we together. We have a little sister. She has no breasts. What should we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? In other words, she's now married. She has a daughter and she's not a marriageable age yet. And she says, okay, when she is of marriageable age, what are we going to do? And look at the answer. The answer is, well, if she is a wall, we will build on her a palace of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. What is it speaking of? Well, the word wall here, if you remember, I showed you the kotel. Kotel in Hebrew means wall. But here the word is not kotel. Okay? It is koma, and it has slightly different meaning. When he says if she's a wall, he's not necessarily referring to a physical wall. Here's another, it's a wall of protection. And you see this in 1 Samuel 25, verse uh, 15 and 16. It has 15, 15, but it's 15, 16. Here it says, the men were very good to us and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields and they were a wall unto us, both night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. So in other words, it's using the word, if she's the kind of person that's going to protect We're going to build upon her a palace. But if she is a door, what does a door do? Toss to and fro. Think of Proverbs 26, 14. As the door turns upon its hinges, so does the slothful upon his bed. That's the way she was before. She was a door. She became a wall. Now he's saying about her, who's her sister, little sister. If she's a wall, she understands protection. I'm going to build upon a palace. If she's a door, then we're going to put boards of cedar on either side of her so that she can't turn to and fro. And then uh, it closes here now with uh, chapter 8. The Shulamite uh, responds, and she says, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. Now, I have underneath that verse what Baal Haman means in Hebrew, the possessor of a multitude. Was not Solomon a possessor of a multitude? You bet he was. 
And it says concerning Solomon, he let out the vineyard to keepers. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. Okay. And she says, uh, my vineyard is mine, is before me. But you, Solomon, must have a thousand and those that keep the fruit thereof, two hundred. So in other words, you know, Solomon wants his portion. And in 1 Samuel 8, 14 through 17, God prophesies about this king, about Solomon. And he says, guess what this king Solomon is going to do? He's going to take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, even the best, give them to his servants. He's going to take the tenth of your seed, your vineyards, give to his officers, to his servants. He's going to take your men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men, and your asses and put them to work. And he's going to take the tenth of your sheep and you should be his servant. So, I mean, he's referring directly to how Solomon, God did not think Solomon was a very good king. You'll see that if you listen to the first part from several weeks ago. But we also see from this in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, we are to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it's to the king as supreme or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, we need to honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. We get what we deserve. Okay? So Solomon was in place. She still had to give to Solomon what he wanted. But the time was coming when everything was going to be turned over to the Lord. So the last part of this here, the shepherd is speaking to the Shulamite. And listen to what he says. He says, you who dwell in the gardens. Before she was in the house. Just wanted to be consumed with the blessings. Now she's finally in the garden working. And he says, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen to your voice, cause me to hear. Do you remember earlier in Song of Solomon 2.14 when he says, oh, my dove, you're in the clefts of the rock in the secret place of the stairs. Let me see your countenance. Let me hear your voice. And so here again, he's telling her, like back then, I want to hear your voice. How many of you know the Lord wants to hear your voice? How many of you talk to him? You know how, you know, it's like, you know, many times the Bible says they forgot me with days without number. God said they don't even talk to me. Communication is number one in any relationship. So we need to be talking to the Lord. But I think it's interesting. Is in. uh, He said about her, you who dwell in the gardens, she's in the gardens. And remember when Messiah rose in John 20, 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why do you weep? Whom do you seek? And she supposed him to be what? The gardener. He's, he belongs in the garden. That's where he always is. But then the Shulamite responds, and we close the Song of Solomon with this. She says, hurry, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young deer, the stag upon the mountain of what? Earlier, she said, I want you to be like a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. And Bether means separation. In other words, you go your way, do your thing. But now, she says, I want you to be on the mountain of spices. And as I said last week, the mountain of spices refers to what? Moriah, the Temple Mount, where he died. That is where he's headed, to the Mountain of Spices. And so we'll close with Micah 4.2. Let me. This is what's coming. It says, many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, that Mountain of Spices, to the house of the God of Jacob. And Messiah is going to teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths for the Torah is going to go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the, the Lord himself is going to come and teach Torah because he hid himself in the Torah and the Jews didn't see it. He gave it to the Christians and they threw it out. So he says, OK, I'm going to present Torah for a thousand year millennial reign. I'm going to teach all of you Torah. This is part of the uh, worship team can go ahead and come up and I'll just close with this thought. I'll touch on it more Monday night. Well, it's interesting. Jacob and Esau, when Jacob is coming, do you remember he divided into two different camps, Rachel and Leah? Okay, he separated them. And from a military perception, it's good to divide so they don't get it all at once. Well, God was wise enough. He gave the Torah to the Jews. He gave the Messiah to the Christians. And it's going to come together. The, the Jews don't understand Messiah. The Christians don't understand Torah. So God is going to bring the two together. Uh, so let's stand.